Our baccalaureate speaker's early life reads like a radio broadcast of a prairie home companion. Dr. Peter Agre grew up in a small Minnesota town, one of six children with a college professor father. His family moved to Minneapolis, where he attended high school and studied chemistry at Augsburg College. While attending medical school at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Agre discovered his love for biomedical research and his focus on third world diseases. After a residency at Case Western Reserve and a fellowship at the University of North Carolina, Dr. Agri returned to Johns Hopkins as a postdoctoral fellow and rose to the ranks to professor of biological chemistry and professor of medicine. After nearly three decades at Hopkins, he moved to Duke University School of Medicine as vice chancellor for science and technology. He returned to Johns Hopkins three years later as university professor and director of the Malaria Research Institute in the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Today, he leads the Malaria Field Research Program in Zambia and Zimbabwe. In 1992, Dr. Agri's lab became widely recognized for discovering aquaporins, a family of water channel proteins found throughout nature and responsible for numerous physiological processes in humans. This led to his receiving the 2003 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Dr. Agri has been elected to the National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society. He has received 16 honorary doctorates from universities around the world. In addition to his scientific responsibilities, he served as chairman of the Committee for Human Rights for the National Academies, as president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and he's led multiple scientific diplomacy visits, including delegations to Cuba and North Korea. We're so pleased his wife, Mary McGill, could also join us today. They have four adult children, the youngest, Carly, with whom we celebrate as a member of the class of 2011. Like so many of you here today, Dr. Augury has never been more than a text away from his road student. Carly recounts the following text exchange. Dear Carly, I'm currently at Dunedin Airport, sitting next to David Beckham. What should I do? <laughs> Carly immediately texted back, get me his autograph. After sending another text to his daughter, asking her what she was doing up so late, he let her know that he had secured the priceless autograph. When she came home that May, the autograph was waiting for her, not addressed to Carly, but her childhood nickname. It read, To Petunia, Hugs and Kisses, David. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Agri. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, President Trout and Reverend Tennyson. And good afternoon to everyone. It's a privilege to be here at Rhodes College, a gem of an institution renowned for outstanding academics and national leadership in volunteerism. As parents of Carly Agri, a member of the class of 2011, my wife Mary, my family, and I are particularly thrilled to be here with you. My only regret is that I did not choose story of Noah and the Great Flood from the book of Genesis for the Old Te Te uh, Testament lesson. But the lessons chosen should remind us of the goals with which we are charged. The passage from Micah signifies our responsibility for world peace, and the passage from Luke indicates our responsibility for the less fortunate. These goals were well articulated 50 years ago by President Kennedy. Let us go forth and lead the land we love, asking his blessing <clears throat> and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. Whether you are religious in the traditional sense or a secular humanist, the notion of God's work here on earth is something that we must take seriously. I would like to use this occasion to reflect on my own experiences and share with you some of the lessons I have learned. An underlying theme might be that one need not be perfect to do something useful in life. And I'll illustrate several points with the wisdom of others, starting with Abraham Lincoln. It is better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak out and, be, and remove all doubt. 
That said, I'm about to risk it all by spending the next 15 minutes opening my mouth. <laughs> College is a special place. As Bill Trout said, I was an undergraduate at a small liberal arts school in Minnesota in the 1960s. And those were days notable for extreme turmoil in our country. In a five-year span, we lived through the assassinations of John Kennedy, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and Robert Kennedy. My college years coincided with unprecedented social disturbances resulting from conflicts over the quest for civil rights and the war in Vietnam. Wanton violence from a balcony here in Memphis, or rice patties in Vietnam, reviewed nightly on te network television. But just, just, despite the consternation experienced elsewhere, those of us in college enjoyed islands of tranquility where important issues and events such as these could be discussed with respect and civility. I majored in chemistry, but science was only part of my interest. I derived great benefit and enjoyment from the other liberal arts courses. This, was, this has caused me to read widely, a lifelong habit. Not a day goes by in my professional life as a physician scientist when I do not dig deep into the readings from my undergraduate days. For as stated by William Faulkner, the past is not dead. In fact, it's not even past. My medical career. A major part of college is to prepare for our life's work, and every student dreams of a career that is productive and satisfying. During my final year in college, I took the examinations and prepared applications for medical school. And in this, in this, I adhered to the insight of Thomas Jefferson, who recognized, a man who qualifies himself well for his calling never fails of employment. But perhaps more to the point was Oscar Wilde, who wrote, it is better to have a permanent income than be fascinating. <laughs> I, I suspect a permanent income is something the parents of every Rhodes College student might be thinking right now. As part of my application to the University of Minnesota Medical School, I took the infamous Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, the gold standard of psychological profiles. My interview for admissions went well, and then the dean asked me a question. He asked me if I had any questions. And after thinking for a moment, I asked him what they had learned about me from this MMPI profile. And trust me, that is the wrong question to ask. <laughs> Dean Sullivan looked at my file and stared right at me. He said, these results indicate that you lie more than average. <laughs> he glanced at my file again and then said, but you lie less than the average medical student. <laughs> I'll, I'll never know if what he said was true, but I believe occasional humiliation can be very good for all of us. Major benefit from my st student research years was the cultivation of an intense joy for discovery, and I agree with past year's observation. Luck favors the prepared mind. But I also feel that it takes a little craziness to see something that no one has seen before. Perhaps Robin Williams understood this when he stated, you're only given a little spark of madness. You mustn't lose it. Work-life balance. This is a major issue in modern life, a challenge for achieving professional success while raising a family. So after years of clinical and scientific training, I eventually attained a faculty position at Johns Hopkins where I established a research team. And while the work was exhilarating, it was also grueling and often kept me from family events, something which I am not proud of. On one occasion, I missed a special performance of the Pumpkin Theater for Children. Our eight-year-old daughter, Claire, had an acting role on stage, and I promised that I would attend her performance on a Saturday afternoon. But a grant application was due the following Monday, and my uninterrupted work that Saturday was particularly productive. When I arrived home that evening, I explained to Claire how busy I was with important work. She scowled as she listened and responded by saying, well, Kathy Schmoke's daddy was not too busy to attend, and he's the mayor of Baltimore. <laughs> Touche, Claire. <laughs> I cannot resist sharing another story. As a single-income family, a scientist with four children, our family vacations were always in a tent. This is, these were the vacations we could afford. And my wife, Mary, always interested in environmentalism and the natural world, organized glorious fam family camping trips to our nation's national parks. Over several years, we visited Yosemite, Sequoia, Zion, the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, Smokies, and others. Then we decided we'd ask the children which national park they wanted to visit next year. And in unison, they immediately shouted, Disney World. <laughs> 
Now, Disney World is not a national park, but we compromised. We camped in the Everglades where Carly, then a baby, was seemingly bitten by every mosquito in South Florida. Then we spent two days at Disney World, and little did I realize that that family camping trip would lead to a Nobel Prize. While passing through Chapel Hill on our way back to Baltimore, we stopped so the children could play with their former class playmates and Mary could visit friends. I used the opportunity to speak with colleagues at Duke and UNC. My laboratory had recently isolated a new protein abundant in human red cells, renal tubules, and similar to related proteins in bacteria and plants, but we were unable to figure out the function of this protein. It was that very afternoon when a conversation with my friend John Parker at UNC first suggested that our new protein could be the long-sought water channel. For more than a century, physiologists have been searching for the channel explaining the phenomenon of osmosis in biological membranes. John's prediction turned out to be absolutely correct, now known as the aquaporins, the membrane channels that control the entry of water into and out of cells. Aquaporins are involved in the generation of spinal fluid, aqueous humor, tears, sweat, the concentration of urine, and numerous other physiological processes. Aquaporins are implicated in, in diseases, including kidney failure, brain edema, glaucoma. Aquaporins also explain how the roots of plants draw water up from the earth and release water from the leaves. I often wonder if it were not for that family camping trip if we had ever made the discovery. Scientific interest grew rapidly, and the Nobel Committee was apparently impressed. The call from Stockholm came at 5 o'clock one morning, notifying me that I would share the Nobel Prize in chemistry. My father, a chemistry professor at a small college, would have loved it, but he died eight years earlier. Always organized, my wife, Mary, called my mother, living alone back in Minnesota, still a farm girl at heart. Mother wisely cautioned Mary, tell Peter that's very nice, but don't let this go to his head. I believe Mother's intention was not sarcasm, while well, I'm not sure. I believe what she meant is that prizes may be nice, but doing something useful is what life is really about. Post-Nobel, while I was perfectly happy with my research career, the prize allowed me to move into areas which I had always dreamed of entering. Malaria is a horrific disease that kills millions of children in Africa each year, and having investigated the role of aquaporins and malaria parasites and mosquitoes, our lab shifted the focus. This allowed me to become director of the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute, and I now spend part of each year conducting field research in Zambia and Zimbabwe. While the benefits of our scientific work may still be far off, the chance to live and work among hardworking subsistence farmers in rural Africa is spiritually uplifting. It has convinced me that there is still innocence in this world. These wonderful people are very religious, and their beautiful children have names like Moses, Isaiah, Miriam. Their lives are hard and are made still harder because of diseases like malaria. Another opportunity has been in science diplomacy, where I served as the senior member of a U.S. scientific delegation to countries with which our government is in conflict, Cuba, Myanmar, Burma, North Korea. Having spent a winter week in Pyongyang with the North Korean State Academy of Science, I became good friends with Dr. Hong, the director of the International Division. Extremely rare for a North Korean, Dr. Hung had traveled to Europe and, the North, and North America. And at the end of our trip to North Korea, Dr. Hung and I passed through the reunification, reunification gate on the road that leads from Pyongyang to Seoul, the capital of South Korea, only 100 miles away. I asked Dr. Hung if he had ever had the opportunity to visit South Korea. He paused. He answered with sadness in his voice, No, that is not possible. So near, but still so far. What I recognized was that despite the cruelty of the Kim Jong-il regime, North Korean scientists want the same thing we want, to leave the world a better place for their children and their grandchildren. When I first met Dr. Hong, he confided that his six-year-old grandson became alarmed when he learned that his grandfather would spend a week in a hotel with Americans. Bring the rifle, he told his grandfather, <laughs> obviously believing the state propaganda that all Americans are evil. Having some extra granola bars, I gave them to Dr. Hong for his grandson. When I next saw Dr. Hong just two months ago, when the North Korean State Academy of Science leadership were invited to meet with us at the Carter Center in at Atlanta, I asked him about his grandson and if he had again mentioned the rifle. 
No, Dr. Hung replied with a big smile. He asked me to bring back some candy. <laughs> Perhaps this is how diplomatic progress is made, one person at a time. So I have some words for the Rhodes College graduate, class of 2011. Someday you may look back in your life, but our task today is to celebrate your graduation. I have just a few thoughts I wish to share with you. First, let me congratulate Bill and Carol Trout. Twelve years of outstanding leadership at Rhodes College. We all owe you so much. To the honors students, class officers, <clears throat> those going on to professional and graduate study, you are the high achievers and your spark sparkling intellectual talents and prodigious achievements are truly impressive. We sincerely congratulate you and encourage you as you depart on your paths to distinguished careers. But I wish to remind you of the passage from the book of Luke. For unto whomsoever much is given, much will be required. Periodic analysis of one's career and reanalysis of one's career is always worthwhile. And 10 years from now, please ask yourself, is my career meaningful? Is my career benefiting others? And as you progress in your lives, remember that accumulation of personal wealth should never be your primary goal. Unless you use your talents for the good of society, those talents are wasted. At the time of his death, Martin Luther King Jr. left an estate of less than $6,000. Despite the modesty of his financial achievements, Dr. King left a legacy that we still consider priceless. To the standard academic track students, you are sometimes considered the middle of the rotors, but you too have earned your baccalaureate and deserve to celebrate. And while you may not receive the highest accolades tomorrow, this in no way, no, this in no way means that great recognition will never come. I'm reminded of someone I once worked for. Raised in a working class family in Brooklyn, New York, Trudy Ellion aspired to become a scientist, even though at that time women were not accepted in graduate schools and were certainly not employed in laboratories. Her first job, the only job she could get in a lab, was to test the acid content of dill pickles for the A&P supermarkets. But when men disappeared to fight World War II, Trudy finally gained a position as a lab assistant at the Burroughs Welcome Company, where her remarkable insight and creativity became apparent. Although Trudy did not have a PhD, she went on to receive the Nobel Prize for inventing the medicines now widely referred to as chemotherapy. I hope that none of you will ever underestimate your potential. And to any Rhodes students who may have struggled with a class or two, do not despair. I know from personal experience that it is very possible to fail many times in life and still achieve success. I'm reminded of a young Californian whose life ambition was to become a writer. Although forced to drop out of college after flunking freshman English, he never, gave up, he never gave up on his dream. His name was John Steinbeck. And to all Rhodes graduates, I wish just three specific requests. First of all, thank your parents for providing a Rhodes College education, and not just the cost, but the whole process from application to graduation. I believe you know how lucky you are. Second, as you say farewell, I ask that you thank your favorite professor and remain in contact during the coming years. Your success in life is the greatest reward any faculty member ever receives. And third, I also ask that each of you please make a special pact and keep in touch with two or three of your closest classmates. These friendships will sustain you throughout your, your life. Now, giving back, and this is not to represent the development office here at Rhodes College, I'm speaking generally, giving back. My generation, the baby boomers, have achieved unprecedented prosperity, but we have failed to improve the world to a state better than it was when we received it from our parents. In fact, I fear that the world is in much worse shape now, and if this continues, we will be the first generation in 200 years to fail in such an important endeavor. We all know what the problems are. Damage to the environment, war, famine, and disease in parts of the developing world. The violent crime in our inner cities with confinement of 2.3 million American prisons, excuse me, 2.3 million Americans in prison, and this is the highest percentage of any country in the world. And the staggering $15 trillion national debt with unemployment hovering at 9%. As Thomas Jefferson wrote 200 years ago, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. And while all Rhodes College students are superbly educated, we at the same time have a growing anti-intellectualism in America. It's really shocking when you think that 400 years after Galileo, 
20% of Americans still think that the sun revolves around the Earth. Half of Americans believe that cavemen and dinosaurs coexisted in prehistoric times, apparently because they saw it on the Flintstones. Many of our public high, school graduate, high schools graduate less than half of their students, and less than half of all Americans read a single book last year. It was Mark Twain who informed us that the man who doesn't read good books has no advantage over the man who can't read them. I fear the emphasis in our country has now become one of fixing the blame rather than fixing the problem. And frankly, I think the accountability for this plight should be shared widely. Unfortunately, the polarization between the two parties in government is now extreme and getting worse. Let me suggest, the hour is late, we must stop the face slapping and join hands to concentrate all of our attention on fixing the problems. It is often said that the genius of this immigrant nation is that we have always found our center, and I believe we need to do so urgently. I'm also convinced that the path to the center begins right here at Rhodes College. Finally, I cannot speak just three weeks before Memorial Day without underscoring the importance of never taking life for granted. We often think that we will engage in activities such as giving back once we finally get established in life. I often refer to myself as middle-aged, but I'm 62 years old, so if, if I'm at midlife, that would indicate I plan to survive till I'm 124. <laughs> Probably not likely. Memorial Day will occur in just a few weeks, and I think that each of us should stop and think of how much we owe others and what they have done for us and for our country. None of us knows how much time we have, and we should all strive to use each day as a precious commodity. While you are now just graduating from Rhodes College, I know that you have already become engaged in the problems we've mentioned. Please continue to be generous with your time, your wisdom, and your resources. The education and experiences you have received here at Rhodes College are excellent preparation for what you'll face. We are counting on you for the future of our nation. And in closing, I'd like to share just a few words that represent the thoughts that will go through the minds of your parents as you cross the stage tomorrow to receive your diploma. These lines were composed by a fellow Minnesotan who became a, the minstrel poet laureate of my generation. His name is Bob Dylan. May God bless and keep you always. May your wishes all come true. May you always do for others and let others do for you. May you build a ladder to the stars and climb on every rung. May you stay forever young. Forever young, forever young. May you stay forever young. Thank you and congratulations. Be careful, it's starting to go to his head.